you all for coming uh, to our first engineering management seminar of the year. Um, so we have Professor Jim Breen with us. Um, Professor Breen is in our engineering management department and is actually going to talk about one of the courses that he's going to be teaching for next quarter on preventing and managing engineering disasters. Um, so I hope you can join us. We'll have a couple more of these seminars next year. Um, those are going to focus on corporate innovation, entrepreneurship. Um, so thank you all for coming. Okay. Thank you, Julie. Okay. Um, so everybody, this is a very small group, so I'm kind of hoping that you guys will ask questions as I go along and that I'm not going to speak for the next hour. Okay. So what I wanted to talk a little bit about, you saw this brochure, but one thing that I want you to get out of this after you're here for an hour is how much the world has changed over the years and how much engineering has actually helped prevent disasters as they go forward. If you think about it, there are disasters happening every day. A lot of the, recently we had the hurricane down in Puerto Rico, okay? And you hear how in, in a lot of cases we don't even have the power up or the power won't be up for months, okay? Um, disasters over in, you know, Houston, and then other places in the world. And there's many different types of disasters, so, so we'll talk about that. But I think, you know, Mark Twain kind of said it right. You know, history doesn't repeat itself, but there are rhymes. I'm a New Yorker, so I kind of like Yogi Berra's way of saying it. You know, you know, Yogi is always an optimist, so he would say, you know, you can observe a lot by watching, okay? And I think one of the things as you get through this, you'll see there's a lot of different ways as you've watched things over the years, and by learning and lessons learned and sharing information, you know, we've been able to prevent a lot of engineering disasters. But I'm going to pose to you at the end, with all the changes come in the world with autonomous driving, you know, with artificial learning, machine learning, do you think there may be some disasters in the future? Okay, so what I'm going to do real quick, and again, I would prefer to get a lot of questions as opposed to me just t uh, talking. I'll give you a quick overview. I'll give you a little bit about my background and experience, and I think that will help you understand why I think certain ways. Um, I'll definitely talk about safety. Oh, I brought a couple slides. I work for Johnson & Johnson, so I brought a couple slides on safety, and that's really important. And to prevent disasters, you need to focus on that. I'm going to talk a, lot, a little bit about normal failure. Okay, I'll show you a book titled Normal Failure. And basically the author said failure is normal. We should expect it, but some of these failures are huge, okay? Um, I'll talk about something called FCI, which is something that we use at work to prevent uh, injuries, okay? And then I think also before I get to the end, I'll talk a little bit about the American infrastructure. You know, the rating this year is D+. Do you think there may be issues in the future here? So we can talk about that. Um, also, I'll talk a little bit about engineering ethics. I think anybody who kind of works in engineering has to understand engineering ethics, but there's some really good case studies of where mistakes were made and people stepped up and took responsibility for it, which you should, and it all worked out, okay? And then I said I'd talk a little bit about the future, and then I'll talk real quick about the course, and I'll take questions at the end. So real quickly about me, I have uh, helped out at Drexel for about 10 years taught a number of different courses, which you can see. I've worked for J&J &J for about 20 years. I've worked in everything from manufacturing, running real estate facilities, network management. Network management means picking what plants will expand or contract and where plants will be located around the world from a business point of view. And then I've done a lot of engineering and project management. Most of the engineering has been in biologics manufacturing. Okay, so if you hear a lot of uh, large molecule um, components, you know, that's typically biologics. Small molecules, chemical synthesis. You can see my focus. And then the other thing I do is I'm actually the vice chair of the uh, ISPE, International Society of Pharmaceutical Engineers, and that's about a 15,000 15, membership around the world. So just to understand how I think, okay, so I've been out of school 33 years, hard to believe. Okay, you guys will be up here one day teaching too. My first company that I worked for is no longer in existence. It was a company called Hercules. They were a spinoff from DuPont. They made dynamite. When I got there in the mid 80s, they were, they were the biggest chemical company that made polypropylene. They made rocket engines, okay? I actually happened to be working in Salt Lake City the day the space shuttle Challenger crashed, 
and I was working on a project to make continuous rocket casings as opposed to the O-ring, if anybody understands what happened there. Um, textiles, and I actually worked in an explosive plant. All that did very early on is taught me how important knowing what was going on in the process, and more importantly, the people around me. I really didn't want to work with people who I thought were going to expose me to risk, and I also wanted to make sure I exposed nobody to risk. Then I went to work with GE, again, heavy industrial manufacturing, worked around the world for them, lived in China, Singapore, Hong Kong, basically power generation, aerospace. What I learned in aerospace is, again, you know, it's safer to fly on a plane than it is to drive your car, okay? And that has to do with the systems they have in the place and the learnings that they've had over the years to prevent disasters because when a plane goes down, it typically is very catastrophic. And I just got off a plane this morning and thank God it all worked out, okay? And then I worked for J&J, &J, um, not as heavy industrial, but a lot of different products that you can use any, anywhere from a consumer product, you know, Neutrogena, Rock, Aveeno, Band-Aids, medical device, which could be contact lenses, or you could have um, artificial knees or hips, all the way up to injectable biologics or pills and, and um, lotions. Okay, so I always like to start with this, okay? This was in the late 80s. I was down in um, Georgia. Anytime I give a safety thing, I, I actually like this. So that's installing about 250 tons of steel and equipment over an operating chemical plant, full operation. We actually, for the only, as we lifted it, we shut everything down. We were allowed to be shut down for two hours, okay? And you can see how they're putting it together. But there were two big pieces and they kind of brought them together. Okay, we wouldn't do it that, that way. That was before we had JLGs. They would, be in, they would not be walking the steel at that point, but things have changed over the last 30 years. Unfortunately, that was the second time we did it. The first time, you can see here, we lifted it off a rail car, the lifting ice broke, and then it crashed. And that cost us six months because we had to rebuild the entire equipment. The reason why I was there is my father and my uncles were operating engineers and crane operators, so I knew a little bit about this, and I actually was checking everything. What actually happened is everything was done right, everything, except for the one last piece. If you look here on the weld, this is what they would call a cold weld. They used the wrong type of welding you know, procedure in the shop. It was not what was recommended, but since we constantly used those welding eyes to lift everything, we thought everything was okay, but we never lifted the welding eyes with, with a, at an angle that has a much stronger force, okay? So there were people for days underneath these things as we're lifting them. And then once we set it up for a different angle for the final lift to put the things together, as you can see here, and it's not a very, very steep angle. It was just a little, everything before that was picking straight up. And it, and it, and it, it let go. And you can see here, if you look down here, it actually tore a steel I-beam apart, okay? So once you have that happen to you, okay, you definitely, and I thought I checked everything, and I did check everything. The only thing that didn't happen was somebody back in the shop about 300 miles away didn't follow procedure. Things were checked, things were double-checked, but it happened. So all I will tell you as you go along Safety is everybody's business, okay? And I will show you as we go through this, in cases where there are things that go wrong, the simplest things will go wrong, okay? We'll talk about things that, you know, where a simple little pump on a sprinkler that's in a chemical plant can cause a major explosion, okay? Because there's gases around where the, where the lawn sprinkler where there shouldn't have been. So again, this is a little bit my pitch from J&J. &J. So we, I use these slides every once in a while to remind people how things can happen. But we have a little saying in J&J, &J, if you see something, say something, do something, okay? Anything, okay? Any, anybody's allowed to shut things down on our sites if they see something wrong. So my goal, if you take the course, is to give you enough so you, when you see something, you know something's wrong. Because in a lot of cases, you may see stuff and it, and it may be wrong and you don't have the tools to know what's going on, okay? At the end of the day, if everybody gets home safe in the same or better condition, it's a good day, okay? And I think that I can speak for everybody who works in industry. 
Nobody wants to get anybody hurt, okay? And then you almost have to take it even farther because what we'll talk about here, in some cases, people are at home and an accident has a, happens around them and it causes fatalities, okay? So this is something that you really have to focus on. It takes a little bit of experience, but what happens when they look at all these accidents, typically it's very simple things. So this is what we do in J&J. &J. I won't read them all, but we believe that every accident can be prevented. We need transparency and we need people to speak up, okay? And again, the other one is we don't really want anybody cutting any corners, okay? j and is a big company, 140,000 people, working in 65 countries, but we really try to drive that. And we're actually not the best of the best of the safety. The, the ones that are really, really good are the big refineries, you know, like Dow and Exxon, you know, where, you know, accidents can be catastrophic versus our plants. So switching now a little bit to engineering and engineering disasters. So I'm not gonna read this. You're all engineers in the room, so you know what engineering is. And I think everybody would like to prevent disasters, okay? So, you know, an event where there's catastrophic loss of life or catastrophic damage, you know, we'd all like to prevent that, okay? What's interesting, I'll show you at the end, actually the UN has a day to prevent disasters. It actually was last month, it was October 7th, okay? And I never knew about that until doing some research. So there's many different types of disasters, okay? And so it can go anywhere from construction, manufacturing, um, and when I say manufacturing, that could be chemical, okay, mining, aerospace, so that could be civilian and nuclear. I think the U.S. actually, the, globally, the world's uh, aerospace industry works very, very well together to share lessons learned. Infrastructure, we'll talk at the end, and we'll just talk specifically about the U.S. infrastructure in terms of our rating by the American Society of Civil Engineers. It's a D+. Plus. If you guys had D pluses in school here, how would that feel? All right, and a little bit about natural um, disasters, which I just talked about, all the hurricanes that recently happened. And then also man-made disasters. So some that you may not know, but some of us would know, things like Bhopal, you know, Love Canal. Okay, these are things that happened years ago, 20, 30 years ago, when you're still, still trying to fix them. So the other thing I will tell you, uh, disasters are around the world. They come from all different ethnic cities. So everyone knows the Leaning Tower of Pisa, based in Italy. And then I would also say, since I'm Irish American, Murphy's Law is also here. But basically, if something can go wrong, it will go wrong, okay? In a lot of cases, and I think as we go forward and as technology moves faster and faster, the complexity, we may not be able to understand the complexity that's coming forward. So you could actually have more disasters. And I think you, the possibility will be there. It'll be, really the question will be how can we monitor this with simulation and all that. So here's a book that I read a long time ago. It was in, it was in the 1980s. It came out mid 80s, late 80s. It was a guy who actually worked on the Three Mile Island disaster, okay? And the way he kind of defined how engineering disasters would happen, he basically says there's six different categories. So one is you always hear operator error, okay? So operations. The engineer or the designer or the architect that designed something could have made a mistake, and we'll talk about that. Well, when I talk about design, it'll be interesting. You'll see we'll talk a little bit about shop drawings, okay? So for the folks who haven't graduated, the engineer typically designs something and then they'll hire somebody to build it and there's shop drawings that come where, they're, where the, the engineer is just trying to make sure that the, the plans for the manufacturer or the contractor are in accordance with his requirements and specifications. I'll show you two examples you know, that caused, one was a very, very, very fatal accident. Another one nobody knew about for 20 years, but it could have been a building that fell down in the middle of New York City and there were plans to evacuate New York City. Procedures, if you had the wrong procedures, you know, you could actually cause mistakes. A lot of that now is picked up in simulations and which really get uh, virtual reality simulators, it will, belie I believe, will reduce the amount of errors, okay? So as technology comes, it's gonna help us a lot, but in some cases it comes so quickly there may be unintended consequences. Environment, I'll talk a little bit about that, you know, how we have contaminated the environment, okay? 
and in many cases it takes us years to clean things up. And then materials and supplies. In a lot of cases we use different components. We think we understand everything about the component or we think we understand all the interaction of those components with other components and we don't. And then there, there are catastrophic failures with those. This was a great book. Um, I would encourage you if you ever want to read it. It's, it's probably hard to get. But basically, Charles was saying that accidents are normal and we have to learn from them. Okay, Three Mile Island happened for a whole bunch of reasons, but it was going to happen. And you'll see in a second, we just had a nuclear disaster in Japan a couple years ago with Fukushima. A lot of that stuff, when you look at it, could we have prevented it? You know, Really, they just lost their generators, which then cause other accidents. So what learnings have we had over the years? Okay, and I think we continuously learn here, okay, and it's important to learn, but in a lot of cases, operator training is much, much better. Simulation, you know, when I came out of school, there was, it was some simulators, nothing like we have today. I think virtual reality is gonna really change that. I'm actually working on something now where the entire plant is designed in a BIM model and the operators will go in and they will walk the floor before they even get there. So we, we believe that the amount of uh, rework, the amount of um, operator misses or, uh, or things that the engineers haven't thought about how the, oper uh, the operators will operate will go down tremendously, okay? Um, and it's costing us actually less than the old way of doing it, okay? Um, more quality control. I mean, if over the last 30 years, the amount of different types of testing from a, both a non-destructive type to also destructive type has improved tremendously, okay? And that allows you to understand more or predict with statistical tools what may happen. And more importantly, to prevent things that you don't want to happen. Um, regulation, okay, there's more effective regulation. In some cases, we've had to add regulation in different areas that weren't there before. And standards, and this has improved the safety. In some cases, other cases, maybe there's more regulation in different environments that's needed and it's stifled us or slowed us down but in terms of certain areas um, specifically I would say the chemical the environmental the nuclear there's much more better regulation and standards and also the regulation also goes into the certification operation and training of operators we'll show you a couple little crane accidents most operators now in the US are certified that was not the case many years ago and then again, I, like I keep talking about, I think the, sim the, the use of simulation virtual reality from a design point of view will help, uh, help us prevent accidents. I think this is actually one good area where you see industry, government, and academia working very, very well. A lot of the courses, or a lot of the materials that I'm taking from my course really comes from the National Bureau of Standards and Testing. They analyze all these different accidents, they do it very, very well, and they share the information right away to make sure that accidents don't happen again. In a lot of cases, those standards will actually also become into new regulations. Those reports will drive new standards and regulations. You saw a little bit of that after the World, the World Trade uh, Center example, uh, World Trade Center disaster. Okay, so two things. There's buildings and there's products, okay? So I'll do a little bit from a building point of view. Think if you're building a manufacturing plant. You know, there's many different steps you you know you have to buy the materials you have to design you have to you have to build it but the that probably would take you two years 30 years the plant 30 plus years the plant will operate okay so there's definitely a focus on the actual construction but i would say the majority of the time is in the actual operation and the the, the majority of the cost in running the plants is actually in the overall operation it's even like if you buy your house Obviously, you pay a lot of money, you have to pay a mortgage to pay it off, but really that house, you'll be in there 30 years in many cases, well after the mortgage is paid for, and you'll pay a lot more money in non-mortgage payments in terms of electricity, you know, uh, electricity um, upgrades, improvements, and all that. From a product point of view, okay, so for folks who don't understand that, usually, like, the products go through product stages, okay, so they... They bring a product out in, in, a, in an innovation stage. Then there's growth. You know, people don't, people don't have the product. They really like it. They buy it a lot. You know, it's a little bit like all the iPhones. You know, you buy it, 
there's something new, I like it, I get it. You know, I get an iPhone 4, then you get an iPhone 6. And then what happens at the end? Okay, I have an iPhone 4, it's at home. I don't use it anymore, okay? Because I have an iPhone 6, okay? And then what happens also at that time is the amount of profit that they can make off a product changes, okay? As the sales are going down, they have a lot of infrastructure, they don't make as much profit, okay? So are they, invent are they investing as much money in the products to make sure they understand what the products are and how to improve them? In some cases, when products are declining, as they talk about here, they'll basically just sunset them because they're just too expensive to keep, okay? Now, if you have an iPhone 4 and you can't get parts, it's kind of difficult, but that happens a lot in industry where they just can't afford to keep the products going. So think about that and think about the profit margins and as they are making products or, or designing products, how they may lose focus sometimes on them. Boilers, okay. Reason why I bring up boilers is one, one night I was away from home working and I was in a hotel in St. Louis and at three in the morning I got a call that one of our plants in Europe had a boiler explosion. I'd actually been by the plant a couple weeks before. Luckily, nobody got hurt. But what happened was we had a 30-year-old boiler that had been just inspected, okay? Inspected in terms of, uh, not from a non-destructive point of view, but in terms of checking that everything looked okay. What happened, the boiler's weld seam failed, and it was a catastrophic explosion and blew out uh, blew out uh, a back end of a plant. It took us about $50 million to fix everything. It wasn't insignificant. It was a little bit, this is not a picture of it, it's a little bit like that. The reason why it cost so much money because everything around the boiler had to be replaced, the chillers, the boilers, the air compressors, and it was a plant that we had no backup capacity, so we probably went a lot quicker than we, we would go normally. Okay, so we probably spent more just to get it up and running. But I would ask you guys here, this boiler explosion from based on that picture, do you think that explosion was because of a gas, a gas explosion or was it a steam explosion? Anybody want to take a guess? So what I'm asking is based on that picture, do you think it was a steam explosion or a natural gas explosion? So was there a leak of natural gas that caused an explosion or was that the boiler that exploded? The boiler in some way gave away, whether it's a well seam or a, a flange connection. Oh, oh no, I asked you. Take a yes. It's 50 50. Well, that's not one of them. Okay. So that probably was, if there's a picture I go up in, that probably was a steam explosion. Because if it was a natural gas explosion, you would see a lot of soot. Okay? All right, and that's one of the things when I first, I had to go, I was in St. Louis and I went the next day to the Netherlands. Obviously the police had things roped off because they didn't know why something exploded. But actually there was somebody who was a little bit older than me, a little bit wiser. He had never been at a boiler explosion, but he says there's no soot. It can't be, we were worried about a gas explosion. Here's something that has a gas explosion. You see all the soot floating around and all that. Now. That's some things you learn as you go through these, these um, examples. You learn different things. You know, actually at the end I'll show you there actually is a Forensics Engineer Society. I never knew this, you know. It's probably very interesting. They have conferences. They, it must be unbelievable what they try to, or what they share. But when you do this, it's all engineering knowledge to figure out how things work, okay, and how things happen. Yes? So for, so when I'm at work, if, there's, if, there is, um, if there was an explosion, an independent party would come in to check, okay? Now, could be the police, could be a different agency. We have insurance companies. In the case of the insurance comp of the boiler explosion, it was seven different insurance companies because nobody would have all the exposure, okay? I think also what they do also is, is um, in investigations, I think it's always better to have an independent, ex uh, um, independent inspector so you can learn. Okay, somebody may, somebody, might, somebody may have made a mistake, an innocent mistake, but you know, if you go back and look, you probably don't see the mistake. If you have other people, you did, okay? And then that's how we found out what we, what we learned in, in, um, 
in our example. And then what happened was we went around and we basically did an inventory of the 900 properties around the world of all the different boilers we had. And we had some boilers more, ex more, uh, more aged than myself, okay? We've retired some of them now. But also, you can have boilers that run forever if they're well maintained. But the older they get, the more maintenance you'll have. And that's what I'll talk from a facility condition point of view. You guys may or may not know this, but if you were sitting here a little less than 40 years ago, in 1979, there was a, a nuclear accident at Three Mile Island, which is over near Collegeville, not too far from here. The industry changed tremendously after that. Um, there were less nuclear plants built. They're, they're starting up again. Uh, the cost of nuclear plants changed. The amount of regulations changed. But there was a lot of different areas from, a, from an engineering point of view that needed to be improved. Operator error, design, redundancy, simulation. Then you've, if you go in the mid-80s, so Three Mile Island was 79. Then you had Chernobyl. Totally different design. The designs are different, but the Russian design is different than the French design versus the American design. As things have gone on, things have kind of what I would call normalized. There's more openness to the design and the, the uh, safety systems. Okay, they're still not exactly the same, but Chernobyl, you know, had a meltdown. Okay, you can see the thing from the New York, the Daily News. Pretty scary. And then I mentioned earlier Fukushima. You know, they have the tsunami, takes out the generators, loss of cooling, and they have a meltdown. And then all of you were alive then, okay? So there was a lot of scary things like, is this going to affect the U.S., which is on the other side of the Pacific Ocean? How many people remember Fukushima? Okay. From a construction point of view, just different type. This guy just missed something because he just broke the entire boom. I'm not sure why. I would think the person who owns it would be quite upset. This one here is um, the Milwaukee Brewers have a, have a stadium up there with a retractable roof. It's called Miller, Miller Park, like Miller Brewing Company. Beautiful, beautiful stadium in the middle of Milwaukee. They lost, there was an equipment error in the crane. That was lowering stuff and they lost the entire roof structure. So they had to basically pull back the start of the opening day by a year. Uh, several iron workers were killed in that accident. I think there was four or five. This one happened about a year ago up in New York City. You know, there was, it, was a, it was a winter day, snowy. They had a large crane. And then, you know, the operators have to lower the booms when the, air, when the wind becomes, I believe it's over 25 miles in New York City. And in the event of lowering the boom, the operator lost control of the crane. It went through two city blocks, killed one person. You know, you know it, it only killed one person, okay? And this was like about 8 a.m. in the morning, okay? It had killed somebody who worked on Wall Street. There was actually a car it fell on, and there was a person in it, but he survived. I believe in that case, the operator, it was operator error, and that operator lost his license. And then this is just looking at different, how, uh, how crane accidents happen in the world. So I call them construction accidents. You know, construction is extremely, um, it's an extremely, um, you know, area where you can be hurt. It's a dangerous area, but there are other places where you can work on a construction site and if it's well maintained, controlled, and people take ownership of their personal safety and the people around them, it can be extremely safe with no accidents. I think the other thing is just, you know, this may ring some bells with people, may not. So a couple different one. I would say the U.S. has had a share of disasters or learnings. This is the Hotel DuPont down in uh, San Juan. It's actually now a Marriott. Um, in that case, uh, I think it's about a 24-story building. I think there was like 60 people uh, perished in it because somebody had just shut off the uh, sprinkler lines, okay? And they were... So the entire building was unsprinkled, and it was a multi-story um, unit. If you go around the world, if you remember a couple years ago, I think, it was, um, in, I think it was in Burma, 
or Bangladesh, one of the ones where the garment workers, you know, there was like, you know, hundreds of people in multi-story buildings unsprinkled, okay? Even though in the U.S. you typically will have sprinkled in multi-story buildings, um, it doesn't happen everywhere today. This was a gas explosion in the, in the 1940s. You know, basically there was a leak valve. You know, the gases got around, hit an ignition source, and about 50 people perished. Okay? Very famous explosion in Cleveland. Everybody knows the Hingerberg. Again, that's probably something about 70 miles away in Lakewood, New Jersey. And then one that you guys may or may not heard, but, you know, since this is Pennsylvania, there's the Johnstown flood where they didn't maintain a dam and it became a best-selling book, okay? And it's talked a lot about, you know, why the, why the dam wasn't maintained, they knew something was wrong, and then it basically wiped out a town and, again, killed many people. Man-made disasters, okay? Some of you may or may not remember Love Canal. So basically it was an industrial facility that made some different agents and then it leaked into the ground and it was right next to a residential area and it became um, a Superfund site. So in the 70s in the U.S. declared several Superfund sites and this was one, you know, one area. And they're still cleaning it up today. Bhopal, Union Carbide, which I don't think is in existence anymore. Um, or maybe I'm wrong. Um, basically, they had a plant in India, and then what happened is where the plant was, um, you know, people actually started to uh, build their homes right around the plant. There was no exclusion zone, you know, where like most times when you have a chemical plant, you try to have an exclusion zone in case there's a gas release or some kind of unforeseen release. In this case, it, it didn't, and the company didn't, didn't respond quickly enough, okay? Um, but that was a huge accident back in the 80s and caused a whole new focus on the chemical industry at that time. Um, down on the bottom, that's the Valdez up in Alaska. So basically, um, the operator of the Valdez, which was an Exxon oil ship uh, re, um, super container, ran aground, you know, probably wasn't at his best. He lost his license, but it took years and years to get nature back to where it was. And this was, a lot of you guys would know, this one is the um, Deepwater Horizon, where BP, you know, there was, they were, and, and again, I'm gonna talk about this in Facility Condition Index, where they had an issue, and then they had a blowout. And then when they went back, there were some questions whether they were maintaining the facilities right, or who was actually in charge because the way they run these offshore rigs is multiple people have different stakes and then the, the, the entity that owns it has just a management oversight. So who was actually responsible? And that comes up in all these engineering disasters, like who in the end is really responsible when you have multiple parties involved. Aerospace, um, you know, I, I mentioned the Challenger. That was one I'll never forget because I was working in a manufacturing plant in Salt Lake City and we were starting to cast you know, rocket engines that were like over 80 feet long, okay? And they were to be single rocket engines, okay, excuse me, 80 meters long. And they were to replace the ones that were used there by Morton Thicol. They were a competitor where you had two pieces put together with an O-ring. So the design that we had would, would have probably prevented that accident that day, okay? Um, but again, that's a great engineering ethics one in terms of people getting overruled on decisions and where something is being done where it had never been planned or validated to be able to do that type of operation. Just other examples, I think the one up on the left hand, that's a good one, that's from one of the recent, uh, when I say recent, within the last 15 years, one of the Japanese um, earthquakes. Um, Japan is, is susceptible to many earthquakes, okay? It happens all the time, but every once in a while, an extreme one will have, have um, some damage. I think a little bit like California, okay? So they have tremors, but you don't have as much damage. But the question is, can you really um, sustain the big one? Or you could say when, when um, the last hurricane was coming up towards uh, Florida, there was a lot of questions that the Florida coast is not designed to a Hurricane 5 force. And the question is, why wouldn't you? because there's, there's an, an additional cost, but it's probably not a lot, okay? 
especially as if that hurricane had hit, it could have been a lot more, um, a lot more damage and a lot more costly. Hopefully everybody knows what a P&ID looks like. So just two, questions, two things about this. One is, over the years, different controls are put in place and they do a lot of HAZOPs, which is called hazard analysis. But I was talking to a friend of mine as I'm, I said, hey, I'm gonna go and talk about this. And he gave me a great example. So he worked for a company and they were a big, big, um, big company, I won't say what type. And they had a plant down in Houston, Texas. And they said, okay, they went to uh, the people they worked with and say, here, this plant in Houston, Texas, I want you to move it up to, let's say, Ohio on the water, up on one of the Great Lakes. Give us a price, you know? They work with them all the time. They're partners and all that. Give us a price. So they get a price. And they start building the plant, okay? And then they find out that down in Houston, Texas, you don't have to put any heat tracing on any of the lines. When you're up in Cleveland, Ohio, or somewhere around there, you need heat tracing or everything doesn't work. That was found out pretty late in the process. Who's responsible? Any thoughts? What's that? Yeah. You could say, I, I, there, I think there's many answers to this one, you know. Yes? The request to move it up to Cleveland, well, the owner asked to do it. So did they have any other facilities in Ohio? They would have moved or anything? That's more information that I have, but <laughs> yes. Well, what happens a lot when you move from state to state, it, especially, especially the structures, the structures change. So they definitely, they definitely would have checked the structure but nobody really thought about checking. You know, if we had an office building in Houston and I moved it up here to Philadelphia, they would redesign the HVAC right away. My point is the littlest things can happen with very, very smart people in the room, even if they work very, very well together in this case. Um, the, re the, guy who, the guy who mentioned this, he, uh, he's, he's a pretty good chemical engineer and he was called in to kind of to uh, be the referee between the two firms about what would be fair and not fair. But it's a simple example, and there's many like that. So again, you know, I, I heard this once, Jack Nicholas was a great golfer, okay? You know, won the Masters many times. But if you check, and you can, you can Google this, every year when he started golf, he first went with his, his guys, his trainer, he went back to basics. He says, I gotta just keep, keep remembering the basics and everything will work. So a lot of that happens here also in these type of examples, okay? The basics is what you can't lose your focus on, okay? It's basic engineering knowledge. But also, never be afraid to ask questions. You remember what I said with J&J, &J, see something, say something, do something? It happens all the time. What I wanted to point out here is there's a tremendous amount of information, and I'll share this deck with you guys. Tremendous amount of information. If you're interested in this, okay, in this type of subject there's a tremendous amount of information which basically categorizes all the different type of disasters that happen in the u.s and other places and what were the actual uh, results now in some cases these are lengthy documents okay i'm not suggesting you read the length but there's usually a good summary and it's all for free and some of it's pretty interesting all right i, fo I found it interesting in the work that i've done over the years and then you know reading every once in a while i'm on a plane a lot so i like to read there's some good things so a couple things, okay? And these are kind of like, this will be the type of cases we'll do in the course, okay? So there was a bridge that, that unfortunately collapsed in Minnesota. Some of you, they call it I-35. It's been rebuilt, it's way over 10 years ago now. And um, you know, it was a design error. It was a design error for a bridge that was built like 35 years earlier, or it was maintenance. So we'll talk about that, okay? Obviously the people that designed it 35 years probably said it wasn't a design error, right? Because it's been working for 35 years. But this is what happens. The reason why I like this one, it also talks about our infrastructure is crumbling, okay? This is one from the 1970s. This is more of a construction type one. So you, you have these big hyperbolic cooling towers, you see them a lot. If you're up by Three Mile Island, you see them. In this case, 51 people, K 
killed. The only reason why they were killed, they kept moving the forms quicker than the concrete had set up. It's a pretty simple calculation people were trying to make to go faster, but, you know, and what happened out of that, there is a lot more standards in place now in terms of leaving shoring and, and forms in place until you can jump the forms at another time. TB, TWA 800, okay, this was off the coast of Long Island, okay, um, and it had to do with a lot, with the, um, some of the probes and the fuel tanks and all that, but actually after, with all the, all the things that had gone on, you know, with, with terrorism at that time, people were questioning what's, you know, what was the real reason for this, for this plane that crashed off the, uh, off the south shore of Long Island. So it took years. They, you can see they basically pulled the entire plane up off the ocean ground and they put it in place in one of the hangars on Long Island and they go through exactly how it happened, okay? I think one of the things about all these disasters in a lot of cases is not to jump to conclusions, okay? You have to get, you know, obviously there's the, there's the black box and all that, but there's other information that solved this case. And this is an interesting one. This one is not one that I've done, but again, I just, I just kind of talked to somebody. Um, a friend of mine, he actually lives about a mile and a half from this, this plant that blew up. Uh, this was a Texaco British, I think British Petroleum plant, not too far outside London, okay? Um, a high level alarm didn't work. Some other things didn't work. Gases were released. They were heavier, they came down the ground and then they went they went around the entire area of the plant and they hit a plant that wasn't designed for explosion proof motor turned on had a massive explosion they could feel the explosion 40 miles away in London okay luckily nobody got hurt but massive damage but again remember my friend who's living about a mile and a half away still lives there there was a whole bunch of discussions at home whether they should or not but he still lives there Shop drawings. I think this is a kind of this is a good one. So just so if, for the folks that don't understand, I'm a professional engineer. I design stuff, and if I hire somebody somebody to build it, then they give me shop drawings or fabrication drawings how they do it, and there may be some calculations or their means and methods of how they want to do things, and that's their responsibility. I'm I'm pretty much responsible for the design intent. This is one that happened in the early '80s. It's basically the Hyatt Regency. What it was is they had a big open atrium and they had a couple of uh, um, bridges that went between different sections of the, uh, of the hotel. There was a party and people are jumping up and down on the bridge. Probably have done it hundreds of times. In this case, catastrophic collapse. And I think there was 40 people killed. It wasn't insignificant in a hotel. And you can see pictures there. You know, when you can see here, there were multiple levels, okay? And what it all comes down to, and we'll talk about this, is the initial design was to have one rod that continually went down, and the, they made a, during the, during the design review, they changed it so instead of going continuously, they have one, so there's a moment connection, and it failed. It had been up for a while. It didn't fail the first day, but it, it failed. And that's what they actually found was the cause. Now, the reason why I bring that up is these are big projects. There are multiple connections. There's multiple things being going on. But a simple little thing, if people don't understand, can be cause of massive collapse. So remember that when I talk about New York City. So you guys probably all know this one, OK? You know, Luckily, in the 1940s, somebody was able to record it, and it, basically everything in 40 mile an hour wind, the entire bridge was moving around. You know, it was the third largest ascension bridge in the world, and it didn't even last one year. We'll go into the, reason, the engineering reasons why, but this one here, because that film plays over and over and over, is why what makes this course kind of interesting how people started focusing on this quite a bit okay what they don't talk about you know they used to build bridges out of 
cast iron. In the 1800s, bridges were falling down quite, quite a lot, you know, 25%, okay? It wasn't insignificant. I mean, I don't think, I came over the George Bershing Bridge. If it was a 25% rate, I would be going in through the Lincoln Tunnel, I can tell you that now. But what happened is people learned about material, the material properties of steel versus cast iron, right? So that's kind of changed. There's still some cast iron bridges left in the world, but they're not the prominent, the prominent type. The reason why I bring that up, just by capturing that video caused a whole new industry, I believe. So how do you prevent these engineering disasters, okay? So there's a lot of education. Everyone's going to school, you hear about that. Even if you don't take this course, you've probably heard of most of these examples. So you have some idea why something happened. There's a lot of research going on, different uh, universities, but I showed you all the work that's being done in the government for all these different disasters and how to prevent them. There's a lot of sharing of uh, learning. Okay, I think when, it, when an accident happens, everybody wants to know why and how can we prevent it again from happening. I don't think anybody wants people to get hurt. New regulations, okay? Building codes get more stricter. The reason why they get stricter is a lot of cases to prevent accidents or become more efficient. I think the industry has taken a lot of, uh, a lot of different industry groups, the, you know, the chemical industry, the nuclear, the pharmaceutical industry, people work together, the infrastructure. And there's new tools that help look at this. So one of the ones I want to talk about is what I call FCI, which stands for Facility Condition Index. And this will get a little bit to the boilers accident I talked about. And there's a lot of what ifs. You know, there's a lot of stuff now where there's a lot of simulation scenarios about how can this work. So FCI is a tool. The US government uses it and they rate their buildings from excellent to poor. So if you're working in a building, would you like to be working in a good or excellent building or would you like to be working in a poor building? Okay, Chris wants to do excellent. He's a smart man. <laughs> so what it is, this is an independent way of rating are buildings being maintained correctly. If buildings are not being maintained correctly or things are not being replaced, if you have a 35-year-old boiler, the probability of a boiler exploding is much higher than a 10-year-old boiler. And most boilers are... are designed for 20 year lives. I'm not gonna go through all this, but basically it allows you to look at your facilities, whether you're good to poor condition, okay? And then you can also look at building performance if you want. And what you wanna be is you wanna be, have a good building, and then you wanna be energy efficient. You can do it on two parameters. We did this at J&J &J because across the world, you have all these different people responsible for running buildings. This was an independent way of saying whether you're doing a good job or not. I think everybody, everybody definitely wanted to do a good job. Whether they really were doing a good job or not is questionable. So another way that we look at it, you could have a building such as this. It would cost us $4 million to replace, but to get it into good condition, you'd almost have to spend $1.3 million. Well, if we don't need that facility, we'd probably get rid of it in a second, okay? As opposed to, this is a good building. It's worth $47 million and they only have to, every year they only have to put about $47,000, $50,000 into the building. What this shows, if you don't constantly reinvest in your facilities, they can become obsolete and they can be a source of problems. That happens a lot. And what was interesting, when we started looking at <coughs> we started looking at it, the U.S. government's been doing this for years. And that's the, how they figure out what facilities they want to keep and which ones they want to get rid of. So just real quick on engineer ethics, and then we're near the end. I'm not gonna, you can read the definition. But really, as an engineer, and the National Society of, of Professional Engineers has ethic, engineering ethics standards. I'll show you them real quick. When you're operating, doing things, you have to be ethical. You have to make sure, first you have to be, make sure things are done right, make sure things are done legally. But the question is, when you find something wrong, what do you do? So we'll talk about an example. I'm not gonna read this, but again, you can share it. If you go up to the National Society of Professional Engineers, there's ethics that, if you're a professional engineer, that you have to follow. And I know there's courses written on ethics here. So here's an example, a really good one. 
So the New Yorker magazine came out in 1995, and they started telling everything that happened about 20 years earlier. So 20 years earlier, this is an iconic building, okay? This is the City Corp building. Had a very interesting foundation design. If you've ever, this is on 53rd Street and Park. The building's kind of, you know, usually you have all the columns are on the corners. There was a church next door and they didn't want to go, so they had to do some things and they kept the church. But they came up with an interesting way. So what happened is, along the side, there's diagonal braces going all the way up. Bill up at the top went to Harvard, went to MIT, engineer, very, very smart. He came up with a very ingenious way of doing it, and he designed the building. And they installed it, okay? What happened is Diane, who was in Princeton, one of her professors gave as a course to kind of check, you know, okay, you're civil engineer here, go check the city court building. And she found some things that didn't seem right. She ends up going to Bill, Bill sees it, He's up in Boston, the project's over, the building's up. And what happened was, during the shop drawings, there was a proposal, instead of having welded moment connections, to go to bolted connections to save cost and money. And I'll send you all the article from the New Yorker, but it came out, and these are kind of some snaps out of it. But what it was is that the New York City um, Department of um, you know, emergency management was involved. If they had a hurricane at the right angle, they had plans to basically to evacuate half of New York City, or not, not half, half of Midtown. The way they fixed it is every night, and they have pictures, they'd have welders go in, take the drywall off, and weld the connection shut. So I'm sure the person who approved a simple little change to save money because bolted connections are a lot quicker than welded connections. You can't check everything. So what I'm saying is the simplest little things could become huge. But this is a huge engineering ethics that he stepped up and actually did it. He wasn't, it wasn't a huge firm. He didn't have a huge amount of monies. They, they don't talk about who paid for everything, okay? But he remained in business, okay? And it's a huge, huge, um, a huge, uh, study that not everybody knows about, okay? But it's interesting. And what was really interesting is if you look up there, it's 1995, and supposedly this came out over some cocktail hour, somebody talking about it. So there, is, there's, there are ways to keep secrets in New York. Last one, America's infrastructure. I'm just, I'm sure you all know this, but you know, they go and they grade us every year on, on our infrastructure, right? So all the trains, the, you know, the airports, bridges and tunnels and roads. D plus. Yes? Maybe, maybe be skeptical of the people who would presumably be getting paid to replace bridges tell us that they need to be replaced. Well, it's not just bridges, right? It's also, so that's a good question. So I'm skeptical. But it all, every once in a while, something falls down here, right? You know, so. Also, I'll tell you from what I can see, and I live, I live above New York City, the amount of work that's gone on recently on the New York infrastructure is unbelievable. All the bridges are being updated. You know, as you come up the New Jersey Turnpike, all those bridges are being replaced. The Pulaski Skyway is being redone. So I think, I think people are taken about it. But, you know, at what point do you get a failing grade here, right? Because you can read their definitions. So D plus means something. But it, we're getting we're getting to the edge, okay? Yes. Who, who were the ones that, that give this grade? The, uh, it's the American Society of Civil Engineers. So you break it up on average, okay? So these are around the world. I mean, around the country. Sorry. Remember, I talked about dams. I talked about a little, you know, the Johnstown Dam uh, down in Puerto Rico. Didn't a dam go? Didn't a dam uh, break recently? after all the rain, right? They were evacuating around the dam. I don't remember if it broke or not, but I think it was about to break. Your drinking water? Right now, in Puerto Rico, a lot of people don't have drinking water because they don't have electricity. Um, you know, you look at, the rail is good. Anybody take Amtrak? You know, would you give it a B? 
All right? What do you think around the world? Excuse me? It goes over bridges. Yes, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so again, I think it's, remember, it's over the U.S., okay. right? So there's many different things. <laughs> it's, not, it's not my rating. I just think it's, it's an interesting <laughs> thing to consider because, uh, one second, Julie. D plus, then F. If you guys were getting F, how, how would it be going in your courses? Julie. Yeah, I'm curious about the difference between the ground and the aviation because the aviation is so much newer than the ground. So why, even if it's Have you been to the LaGuardia Airport? <laughs> Okay, I believe it was called the Third World Airport and we're fixing it now, okay? So I think a lot of it has to do with, if you go to like, especially like, um, so this might be unfair, but if you go to, uh, I used to live in China, if you, go, if you go to China, all the airports are brand new. Now, 30 years from now, what'll happen, or 50 years, okay? Maybe because of the impact. Yes, yes, yes. So is that what's made it in, in the impact? Yes. Now, does this mean things are unsafe, or does it mean that they're not modernized? Like they mean aviation. Like you just said you're just comfortable flying a plane today, uh, but you have to give an aviation a bid. Is that more for the? I think that's the airports for me. That would be the airports than airports. than the planes. I think. But is it more so because you got the uh, uh, luggage problems at the airports or a lot of? The well, you have a lot of delays at the airport because the gates and all that. Yeah. Yeah, and handling. I mean, if, you, if you've ever flown into Singapore, from the time you get off the plane till you get through immigration, and it's quick, it's quicker than your things there. I mean, and it, it's unbelievable. And I mean, that's, having been, I lived there. That's hundreds of times. I think I can only think of one time it, I beat the, the back. Correct, correct, correct. But like when you get to roads or bridges, you know, it's really getting to a different area. They're not shutting the bridges down. They're just saying, going back to my facility condition index, we should be planning money to invest in them or we have to change them totally out. Okay? I could send you a link to it. It's a good read. It comes out every year. Um, you know, multiple different ways of looking at it. Okay? Go ahead, Tart. I think school buildings. Okay. okay. Yeah, this is all civil engineering infrastructure. Okay. All right. So if anybody took the course and if you were interested, I didn't know this, there's forensics engineers. They have conferences and all that. They have a website where they share all this information and it's interesting. Okay. I didn't know this, but you know, there's a lot of folks that are involved in this space because there are a lot of accidents that happen around the world. Okay. So, last three slides. So what do you think is going to happen in the future? We're going to go all digital. Okay, healthcare is changing totally. Anybody here, uh, Industry 4.0, Internet of Things? So we're going to have 3D, we're going to have machine learning, we're going to have artificial intelligence. The last pro book, is a, it's an old book, but um, I took a course a long time ago. It, this really has to do with the rate of change of technology. So I got a degree in technology management, which was a great degree, because I really like to read things, I, and I, I'm really comfortable with change. So this talked about crossing the chasm, you know, from the time a concept works to get enough people to adopt it, okay? Because in the beginning, a lot of people will try different technology, but once you get the mass to move with you, okay? So the iPhone started very early and there were some early adopters and then mass, the mass majority jumped onto it and then we went over to here. And then again, remember my thing about the product life cycle? Here's when you're going and here's the decline again. So 
when you look at all this in terms of machines, um, I was at a conference this weekend and they were saying that about 60% of the work that everybody does today will be replaced by computers. But only 1% of the entire workforce jobs will leave. Okay, so that, what that means is 60% of what I do today will be replaced by a machine. But if I was, you know, if I was an iron worker, my job wouldn't be replaced. Not everybody's, 60% of the jobs won't be replaced. We'll have to constantly learn new things. And I think that's happened over time. But just the sheer speed of how things are going, you know, when you're having car, driverless cars, et cetera, do you think there'll be accidents or things that we haven't thought about? I do. Okay, so for the course, if you're interested, there's just, and Chris can send it to you. It's 11 weeks. I usually do a quiz every week okay on the readings I haven't heard anything bad about that so people like that we'll do some case studies discussions and then we usually per a term project and we'll, we'll have a group do it these are the three books that I propose using one of the ones is to engineer a human the role of a successful design uh, this guy Henry Porofsky he has written probably like 10 books on engineering disasters really good the next one is inviting disasters. So it basically goes over probably about 20 different examples of failures and looks at what happened and then how it happened from an engineering point of view. And then this one really just has to do with more business side. So, you know, you know how, the, how we um, design different cars that, you know, put the gas tank in the back and then somebody would drive into the back and they would explode. So we, we don't have those cars around anymore, okay? But really just Brazier, you know, different type of design disasters and ways that we have learned over time. I mentioned this when I was just kind of Googling for stuff. Um, somebody mentioned this to me. Actually, it was, I'm uh, sorry, I said the 7th, it was 13th. The, the UN has a whole bunch, they're focused more on natural disasters, but they have a whole history library of disasters that they've kept over the years. And actually, I didn't realize they actually have an international day to prevent disasters. So it's huge. So I would say the best way to predict the future is to create it, okay? So what I try to do every day is just make sure that wherever I am, people are safe and make sure nobody gets hurt, okay? That's the first focus. If everybody goes home and there's no injuries, usually it's a good day. Um, and I would encourage you guys to do it. Um, a lot, like I said, over, because I worked in multiple industries, you learn different things, which has been great if I just worked in one industry. Um, I, and I would tell you some of the industries that I worked early in my career, I probably, if I knew everything, wouldn't have worked in them, okay? Um, but things change over, over time. So that is a quick summary of what I would like to talk about in the course and a little bit about engineering disasters. So I would open it up to any questions if you guys like. Yes? I remember when the uh, bridge collapsed in uh, Minnesota. I was up there at the time. We thought about over that bridge. Uh, but immediately following, there was such an emphasis on, we've got to fix all our bridges in the United States, we've got to start expecting. Now it's 10 years later, I haven't heard any disasters on bridges. Has that been effective? Yeah, so, um, so I would do two things. Um, there was two slides that I didn't put in. So I, I grew up in a place called um, Mount Vernon, New York, which is right above the Bronx. And when I was young, so it was probably in the 70s, there was a bridge that was on 95, and it was right over the border. In, it was right near Greenwich, Connecticut. And what they did is they had like a pin connection. And a bridge on 95 actually fell into the water. And people, and if people remember that. So what I would say is, yes, yeah, so we haven't had a bridge fall in 10 years. I don't know why we have, should ever have a bridge fall, right? So the question is, now I just mentioned the Pulaski Skyway, this all bridges, you know. Um, the Gothel's Bridge has been replaced, you know, the, uh, you know, they, they've done the, uh, in New York City, they've done the Brooklyn Bridge, the Manhattan Bridge. I actually have, my, one of my brother-in-law's uh, brother is an iron worker, and they, they're just going bridge to bridge to bridge. And then when they finish, they'll just go, 
He's in his 40s. He wants to go one more round, as he told me, because we have to constantly invest in this. I think what happens is when we don't invest, and that's that FCI index I like to talk about. It was a way I've never saw it before. And I like it. It shows are we investing enough. So what's going to happen as things go along, cities, governments, it's happening right now. Like, where, you know, where are we going to put, where are we going to find the money to reinvest in the infrastructure in the U.S.? But it is critical because once we don't have infrastructure, you see it in Puerto Rico. They don't have power. They don't have water. It affects everything. Anybody, uh, Superstorm super Sandy, you went through that. I didn't have, I live up in New York. I didn't have power for about 15 days. I mean, it really affects things. Work slowed down quite a bit and all that. No internet. My son was young then, at that time and, you know, with no uh, internet, no cell phone, he had cell phone service, but no games and TV. It was quite an interesting time because he wasn't used to not having that. But yeah, so I think, I think, uh, I would just go like, I don't think bridges should fall down. I just think they should be taken down. Yeah. Yeah, and I think everybody wants to do it. If you saw that article up there, when we talked about I-35, the article said it's 10 years and we still have poor infrastructure. You saw the, the grading of it. I think they're having a hard time coming up with the money and really uh, prioritizing what they, what they want to do. Yeah. Well, I think with the bridges, you know, I expect them to work. You expect them to work, right? Can you imagine the George Washington Bridge fell down? It would, it would you know, in addition to the catastrophic failure, it would disrupt the entire um, economy of New York City and New Jersey, I believe. So it should be. And you, they're constantly working on it. They're just redoing the, uh, a brand new bridge, the Tappan Zee, which is north. You know, that bridge was built in the 1950s, and it, it handled a lot more traffic than planned. So, you know, I think we need to focus on making sure we maintain our infrastructure. Yes? You know, another question. Whenever there is a disaster, it sometimes affects an industry. Like you mentioned, Three Mile Island. Um, that did kill the nuclear power most of it. It was going pretty hot and heavy, and then Three Mile Island came along, and uh, there were regulations put on. Uh, but, but really, I don't, I don't know if there's been a nuclear power plant since Three Mile Island in the United States. In it. the United States, yes. Okay. Yeah. Water. I don't know what your normal was, but the primary thing was big. But secondly, there was there was no cases, increased cases of cancer and things like that uh, in, in uh, Harrisburg. Yep. Area. But yet the industry died. Yeah. So uh, no, I I don't disagree with you. I think what happened it became uneconomical, right? Yeah. So when, when they started putting all the things, I think the other thing is, if you look at in the US, I believe nuclear power, it's not insignificant the amount it generates. It's like 25, 30%. It's not insignificant. It's not like France where 80% is nuclear, okay? And then other countries continue to build nuclear plants. China's building a whole bunch of them and all that. So, but I, I don't disagree with you. It, it, it slowed down the entire industry to the point that uh, they started no new plants. And actually, there, and there was, sorry, Chris, there was a plant up in Long Island, Shoreham, that finished after Three Mile Island, and it was never allowed to start up because of the evacuation plan. We do have a question from some of the online audience that we have here. So, how do you think that the integration of the Long Island and focus on project risk management will affect the probability and frequency of these types of disasters? Wow. <laughs> Read the question again. <laughs> It's a good question. Uh, uh, how do you think that the integration of and focus on project risk management will affect the probability and frequency of these types of disasters? Yeah. Like, how do you think that the integration of focus on project risk management? Yeah. So I think you know. Um, so he's he's just talking a project. So I think you know as you're as you're looking at different type of project risk, you'd be focused on safety, making sure engineering gets done on time, you know, making sure construction gets on done on time. 
I think that would go into the whole risk register and you know, the probability analysis. Um, but I, again, I think the most important thing is using lessons learned and try to replicate it as opposed to doing new things. Okay. Yeah, I think the example they use a lot is like Uber. Yeah. Uber has no cars, right? They have no assets. You know, um, what's the other one? Um, the hotel, Airbnb. They're huge, but they have no assets. So the question is now, do you need assets? But I think at the end of the day, you'll still need, ro you'll still need roads and all that. You know, everybody's trying to do smart, sustainable cities, moving back to the to city center. So I think it'll be even more important. But It's just a different business model, right? Because somebody, like a lot of the hotels you go into, it may say ABC Hotel, but it's not owned by that chain. They're just, they're just um, a licensee of the brand, right? So, but you know, it, it's, it, it um, you know, a lot of people work from home now, right? Do you need as much office space as you did before, right? So, but it's interesting. I think it, it, the, as technology goes, it'll be interesting. Yes. You start, I think you started talking a little bit about the automotive industry. When you look at, you got anti-collision. Now I see that you have something that keeps you in the lane, cross over the lane. Is it only a matter of time where it's an unmanned vehicle driving, where it's automatic, where you're just a passenger and it's driving on its own? Yeah. I, I personally, I think that'll happen. I mean, I actually um, I had a rented car not too long ago, and um, you know, this car I got too close to something. And it, and it jammed the brakes on. And, and my Avalon that I have here doesn't have that. It was, it was a weird feeling, but it, it was the right thing to do. You know? And I, I, I would have stopped it, I believe, myself. But this thing just, it sensed it and said, okay, I'm, I'm shutting down. Um, but you know, all the different sensors back up. But you know, what if you're in the car? I, I mean, sometimes it's hard to be in the passenger seat when people are driving. How are you gonna feel when you know, somebody, you can't even see the person gonna drive? Okay? All right. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. <laughs>